Well, thank you everyone for joining us for this next panel on scaling go-to-market. Let me start by introducing our two panelists here today. Firstly, Prashant is CEO of Stack Overflow, the world's largest developer community with over 100 million monthly visitors to the platform. Previously, he served as SVP at Rackspace and led, led its managed cloud, co-location, and security businesses. And prior to Rackspace, Prashant was at Barclays, coincidentally with me, and at Capgemini. Corey is the CEO of Rapid7, a cybersecurity company focused on application security, vulnerability management, and managed detection and response. Corey joined Rapid7 in 2008 and has, led, and has led the company as its CEO for the last eight years, including navigating the company through a successful 2015 IPO on the NASDAQ. Prior to Rapid7, Corey held marketing and product roles at Parallels and Microsoft, and also served as a consultant at Deloitte. Thank you so much, Prashant and Corey, for joining us today. So let's start Thank with something, let's start with something that's you know real value, valuable advice to the founders listening to us today. You both arrived at your CEO roles via prior leadership positions in sales and marketing. What characteristics would you advise founders to look for when they're hiring their first VP of sales or VP of marketing? And Corey, I'd love to start with you. So one, one, thank you so much for having me today. Is there a little echo? Is it? No, I think you're good. Great, great. So thank you so much for having me today. You're right. I actually had marketing roles at both Parallels and Microsoft before. That said, is I've actually made a number of screw ups and just hiring people based on the companies they worked at uh, or the pedigree that they actually had. What I generally find is that what you want, especially if you're actually building something in an earlier stage, is someone who actually has experience building. Um, and what I frequently found is that if you hire just someone that actually has the pedigree or had actually done it at the scale, they don't necessarily have the skills to actually go create the infrastructure and to actually do it at the stage and the level that, that you are. And so what I'm frequently looking for is for wherever I am in my journey and in my stage and in my evolution, who are the people that are actually um, most likely to be successful there? Now, ideally, they've actually done it before, uh, but if they haven't done it before, then what I try to do is I actually try to interview and meet people who are successful there and say, what was your background right before you were successful at that job? Um, and so again, everything is contextual to the stage of evolution and what's actually in front of you for the next couple of years. And so I would just really encourage people to think about sort of not focus so much on pedigree, but focus on what's the job to be done over the next two years. It's a great point. This point around pedigree and just not focusing on the logos of the people who are, you know, and the jobs that they've kind of worked at before is really, really important. Prashant, any, anything more to add there? Yeah, I, I really love uh, Corey's answer and totally agree. So the way I've thought about it, there's almost two dimensions. The first one is similar to what Corey is mentioning around hiring VPs of sales or VPs of marketing for a state specific uh, situation in the company. So I think in many cases where I, during my time at Rackspace, when we were building something brand new or even at Stack Overflow, I think, yeah, you know, this company is about 10, 12 years old, right? And had a certain team and, you know, sort of a VP of sales before. So in my mind, there are actually sort of, you know, four different phases. And when you start out as a, I think as a founder who's listening here, you probably want somebody who is more of sort of a jack of all trades. You're probably pulling together sort of a ragtag of, you know, salespeople that are very capable, ragtag as, and I mean that in the nicest way, which is, which is people that actually are well-rounded and actually being able to talk about the product. They're probably coming from the product team in many ways. And their skill set is actually to be able to articulate in a very kind of uh, credible way with customers on a daily basis because they're coming from the exact problem set that the customer is solving. Uh, and so that's to, to the early stage person. I think the phase right after that, I think is Corey touched on this, which is sort of a builder VP of sales who's really, really adaptive, you know, putting the infrastructure down, as he put it, of, you know, the process uh, creating some sort of a repeatable process for sales and to create a, a some level of, a, of accountability and repeatability in the kind of end-to-end -end sales process across the company. And then I think you move on to kind of more evolutionary phases where the next phase is probably somebody who just layers on a lot of scale. And to do that, you just need a really the ability to forecast really, really well uh, for, the, for, the, for, the, for the quarter, for the year. And, you know, Corey being a public company CEO, he knows this better than anybody. Uh, and we're making our way there, right? So that... 
forecasting ability and you know being able to really be uh, very very clear on uh, on the forecast kind of the predictability of that. And then the the final stage, of course, is the the big company sales leader who's who's just a machine of like driving the spreadsheet and just you know it's a completely different level of abstraction. And so I think those phases. Uh, you know, sort of to expand on Corey's uh, point. And the only other point I mentioned in the second dimension, Sid, is uh, really hiring uh, both obviously the attitude and cultural fit and all that. But the second dimension is really still as you progress in your company as technology leaders, having the ability to have salespeople that are uh, truly articulating how the how your product solves the problem. So I think it's underestimated having technical knowledge and salespeople and people that come in, coming from places where they truly understand and empathize with the user. Uh, I think is a huge boon. I think there's a big difference between that and sort of a traditional salesperson that's just been doing, you know, uh, the traditional traveling salesman, I think is no longer sort of the, the, the kind of the mode for technology companies. So hopefully that's useful. Uh, I, I love the way that you put in these three different personas of, and types of VP of sales and marketing roles. I think it's so important. And I, I say this to my founders all the time that for every single role, somebody might, you know, outgrow that role. And you may need to go and you know find somebody better. And you have to recognize at what point do you make that change or you let that executive continue to grow. And some people will grow and others are just really good at that early stage. Or others are really good at that public company stage in their specific function. Prashant, for the next question, I wanna stick with you and talk a little bit about your prior experience at Rackspace. You know, many, many people don't know this, but you know, early on at Rackspace, you were the general manager of the public cloud business. Uh, and it ended up becoming the fastest growing business in the company's 20 year history, going from zero to multi hundred million in revenue in just three years. You know, mo most founders are would, would, would die to be able to, to show those stats. So any advice that you can share with the founders here on how you went about doing this and perhaps, you know, lessons that they can learn and, and apply in their own cases? Yeah, I, you know, I think it's a combination of many things that just sort of, uh, you know, happen to come together. So, you know, thank you for that. I would say the, uh, the, the main thing I think is, uh, I think go, doing it at a company like Rackspace that was already sort of an established mid-market company called, you know, a couple billion dollars of revenue and sort of creating a brand new business within that infrastructure, I think is sort of a different experience relative to starting something from, uh, from scratch. So I just want to make sure that's, uh, that's clear. So for us, I think being able to sort of, disrupt ourselves in sort of the nick of time to take advantage of sort of an emerging trend that was happening. Because we, when we talked to a lot of our customers, uh, our Rackspace customers, and back then we were competing against Amazon Web Services uh, and Azure, et cetera, uh, we started noticing that almost all of them actually had, uh, you know, accounts on AWS or Microsoft Azure. So it made a lot of sense. And there's sort of a, a kind of a, uh, an existential moment in the company to say, are we going to continue to compete? And especially in the infrastructure game, that's sort of going to go to zero, or are we going to actually just partner in a way that's going to be, we're going to be able to ride sort of this trend that's actually, you know, far bigger than all of us combined. And then to enable that, we thought about what are our vantage points or advantages that we had as a company, right? So the two things that we had at our disposal, number one is that we at our heart, uh, you know, we were a services company, our entire customer base, really loved us and came to us and we were differentiated by the fact that we had excellent excellent people that were uh, you know very customer centric and were able to serve customers through you know technology uh, centric uh, uh, kind of knowledge and so we talked to a lot of our customers and we leveraged our install base to basically build a service out of nothing uh, and we had a founding team that helped do that so that's point number one our vantage point was our install base that loved us for that and then going with that services dna uh, we had also a company of phenomenal uh, company of learners, people that just really thrived on being able to adapt their own skill set to learn about the next technology. So we took, we put through a very much a factory of, you know, uh, people that were great system administrators and made them AWS experts. And we got them to get certified and same thing with Azure and same thing with Google. And so again, that was our vantage point, our strength. And so I guess in summary, I would say, Sid, is that, um, you know, it was a market opportunity that was far bigger than any of us. And so move, you know, flow in the river that the river is flowing in, right? Don't flow against the river. And then secondly, it's just utilize things that are your advantages uniquely that are your advantages. That, 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 that applies to mostly an existing company versus a startup company, but that hopefully is, uh, is clear. Very, very helpful. And, you know, I'd say three big things that I'd summarize from there. One, you know, move towards exciting markets. And clearly with cloud, you made a big bet there. Two, 
you know, try to leverage your existing customer base. And for Corey's next question, I'll talk a little bit about how you do that. Uh, and then three, you know, try to, to, to build out a team and a culture that is constantly learning and evolving. As new products come out, people are willing to kind of go and test those out into the existing customer base. Corey, I want to connect all this with Rapid7. You know, Rapid7 has consistently innovated over the last few years, uh, moving initially from vulnerability management into application security more broadly, into managed detection response, and most recently into cloud security. What advice do you have for founders as they're launching new products, as they go through this process of scaling? Yeah, it's, it, it's a great question. And um, I think there's two dimensions that you actually have. Is there very simple um, propositions and skill sets required to actually successfully launch a new product and find mar product market fit and scale? And one of the things that we actually found was that what's incredibly difficult is to actually do those two things at the same time. <laughs> to actually have different things at different levels of maturity. It's just that because, you know, it, as humans, it's really difficult for us to actually switch between different models at once. And so with that, I actually just go back to what Prashant said earlier, is that what's your underlying fundamental? And it is that learning engine. And so the way that we actually sort of like thought about it, and the way that we actually set it up, is that no matter where you are at any level of the journey, one, we're actually gonna have enough understanding and intelligence to be honest and intellectually honest about where we are at any sort of like stage of evolution. And every product, every feature, every market, every segment has to have an intellectual honest assessment about where it is in its market adoption and customer adoption and usage adoption cycles. The second thing that we actually have is that once you actually have that foundation that you're gonna be at different places and different stages, um, there's a mentality that the goal is to keep learning and keep progressing and keep moving forward from there. Uh, what that allowed us to do is to actually not translate success in one area to success in another area. And if you think about sort of like the um, problems of hubris, it's just like, I crushed it right here. We're good in you know, vulnerability management market or we're good at this segment of the market. And therefore I'm globally good at everything. Um, <laughs> and and it, which just isn't true. And you see that so much is that people translate success in one area to global success. And what happens is that you really got to say like, all right, this is where it's being successful. This is the next leg of the journey there. But everything has its own journey that it actually has to go on. And that requires discipline and intent that's about this never ending constant learning cycle and evolution um, that you're actually on. And that's a big part of what we have to instantiate in the culture overall. Thank you, Corey. Uh, how do you go about also ensuring that you don't cannibalize your existing product messaging? You know, this is this ends up being a big debate between the sales team, the marketing team, and the CEO, who's usually running product. Uh, so true. Well, I think that's much to the chagrin of many people in the company. Like people like me, love to actually sort of like be deeply involved in the product discussions, the product engagement. I think it's a very good question. I, I, for me at least, I would say there's approaches, but it's less art than, uh, it's, it's, it's more art than science that's actually there. And so, you know, the first thing you actually have to do is say like, internally inside companies, we tend to actually think customers care as much about every single thing that we do um, than customers actually do. And so I would say, listen, if you want a, a cheap end way around it, is you have to actually constantly be having discussions and have a realistic assessment about like what's on your customer's mind and what's happening. Um, and, and the reason that's important is that uh, your mind share of customers, almost no matter where you are in your evolution, um, this was true when I was at Microsoft, it's true at Rapid7 at every stage of growth, is never where I want it to be. I always want customers interested in every minute thing and de detail and feature. And I'm always convoluted and I'm always confused when I go out and customers say that like, I really want the product to do this. And I'm just like, we introduced that last year. How could you not know? And really, I think that that goes to uh, the sense of you actually have to actually treat communication as its own specific rhythm and customer education and engagement at its own thing. And this one, I just say is one where you're going to have inherent conflict. I would say that at least from my perspective, is there's a very simple way you actually rationalize that conflict is you have to be hyper intentional about what's the customer most interested in. 
And it's, you know, as far as it goes, you know, what I tell the team is that like the only way you should actually get in front of customers as a super customer bandwidth, if it's something that the customers naturally have interest in. And if the customers don't naturally have interest in what you're actually doing, you should actually figure out that we playing what you're doing in a way that's actually interested or do something else that actually the customer is more um, interested in. Um, because when you're actually doing multiple features, multiple capability, multiple services, um, you, you have to be cognizant of how much you're actually trying to push through a single voice. And the easiest way to address that is to actually just respond and frame everything you do on customer demand that's sort of like that latent demand that they're asking for. Yeah, it's, it, you put it really well, this point around listening to the customer before you go and give your own messaging. Try to understand what the customer needs and what your broader you know, landscape really needs before you go and adapt your messaging. Uh, you know, before I go on with, with additional questions, I just want to let the audience members know that Corey and Prashant are happy to take your questions. The best way for you to do that is to type them into the state chat, and I'll try to get through as many of them as possible. So please do put them in. Uh, I'll go on to the next question, though, while we're waiting. Uh, Prashant, I'll start with you. Obviously, this year has been a weird year for selling. Uh, we are all virtual. It's hard to, to sell when you can't meet your customer in person. Uh, what have you learned from this experience, you know, this virtual experience? And do you think there are one or two innovations that have come out specifically around lead generation from this experience? Yeah, I think, you know, great uh, question and one that we've been sort of living real time, right? So during my time at Rackspace, it was very common for us, obviously, like any other enterprise company, I'm sure like Corey, uh, we were all traveling everywhere, going to customer uh, sites, you know, preparing, you know, traveling a day, spending, you know, an hour and a half at maybe the customer site and then traveling back that second day. Uh, and that, I think, what's we've, what we've learned, at least what I've personally learned, is that senior executives or CEOs or CIOs or CTOs are a lot more accessible today uh, to do that sort of thing, like literally, you know, on short notice. And that's, that's it's just been amazing to me, uh, the number of customer conversations I'm having or prospect conversations I'm having have almost, you know, probably at least two to three times more than what I was doing on a weekly basis. Uh, and so it just seems like, you know, it's, it's, it's very, uh, it's become sort of the norm now for say, to say, you know, can we have, can we hop on a call for 30 minutes and there was a senior person and previously, that would have had to go through a lot of different, you know, uh, stage gates of approval, uh, et cetera. But now it's, it's they're just in general very, very accessible, especially if you have something of value uh, that you are presenting up front. So that's the big. That's been the biggest learning, uh, Sid. That you know, I don't think people should be shy uh, about approaching senior uh, economic buyers or decision makers, et cetera, because it's just, uh, it's, it's just they're they are more accessible. Uh, in the context of lead gen, uh, one thing that was a discovery this year, what we've learned is that. You know, even online events, with the exception, of course, you know, something like this, this is like a very different sort of event. But I would say uh, traditional conferences that basically ported over to, um, I won't name them, but they, they would say ported over to, uh, you know, kind of online versions. And, you know, where you try to take what you would traditionally do, which is you would basically have a booth and you would have salespeople at the, at the, at the you know, at the expo hall or, you know, or have, you know, customer meetings, et cetera. Um, you know, that, that stuff was basically uh, pretty useless, uh, to be very blunt this year, in my opinion. So I, so the, the, what we've learned is that, you know what, we have to pivot our, uh, our marketing efforts to be a lot more, uh, what we've learned that it seems to be resonating, where we do a lot more intimate field marketing type events, where we're bringing people together around a common problem and perhaps a thought leadership topic. And that is a lot more compelling than just sort of showing up at some conference online and hoping that people show up at your virtual booth. Uh, then the reality is that, you know, most people are watching this stuff asynchronously and, you know, you, it just, it's very, very hard to kind of like control. So that's probably the biggest learning. Uh, and this is sort of, to be honest, like sort of a, a work in progress. I think we're trying to figure out uh, exactly as we test multiple uh, demand gen uh, efforts, uh, you know, specifically as it relates to events, how to maximize this. So hopefully that's useful. It's a, it's a great point, and Prashant, as you know, I speak to over 150 CTOs, CIOs, and CISOs, and this point around, you know, they are more accessible today than they were a year ago, and their budgets haven't really dramatically changed, particularly for technology use cases, is a great mm -hmm. one. And it's, it's, it's absolutely a positive one for all of us in the technology realm. Yeah. Corey, same question for you. Obviously, Rapid7 has had a, an incredibly good uh, third quarter, 
you beat analysts' expectations. So you've been doing something right on this front in terms of talking to customers. A any learnings? Yeah, so one, I would just echo the the prior notion that people are much more open to actually engage in the actual world before. The second thing I would actually say is that um, people are seeking community. And what that means is one of the things that we're having success with is actually doing small, intimate forms of customers connecting with other customers uh, and people having discussions together. And that's just incredibly um, not just effective because you know your customer is going to be your best advocate for sort of like what you actually do. Two, you actually learn much more when you're actually sort of like listening to people um, engaging with, with one another. Uh, but the third thing that I actually say is actually serves a pretty good social thing right now because people are actually looking to be more connected um, in, in ways. And I'll say we start to scale these more intimate settings um, right now. And I completely agree that you know we'll be spending less money necessarily. Um, on big virtual things um, and much more so on sort of like smaller intimate engagements that actually bring people together. So that's been that, that, that's been one centralized learning. The, the other one I would actually say as we actually go through this period is that while people are more open to engaging, they are inundated um, with lots of requests for lots of different um, things. And I think what's hard and that what, what I found hard is that customers' mindsets have actually shifted about what's both important and how they actually think about things. So I think one of the things we all have to be careful with as builders is not taking a um, a lateral view that just says like, you know, customers ask for this and I'm just going to keep building off these strain of assumptions that actually go forward. And you actually have to be constantly checking in because one of the most confusing thing I find for like product leaders or product managers or engineering leaders um, is they go out and they just, you know, they're not getting the traction. It's like, I validated it, I talked to it, and you go in and you talk to the customer and, and you know, you come back out and it's very different than what someone told you sort of a year ago. And that happens. And so I just think that one of the things that people that are successful in this environment, especially right now, have to keep in mind is that it's a fluid environment. There are some fundamental things that we can always look to, but I think that people are being successful are actually making sure that they're honing continuously the, you can call it the value proposition, you can call it whatever you actually want to call it, but they're constantly honing and making sure that they're becoming more relevant. You know, one of the rules of thumbs that I like to think about is every day you're actually either becoming more relevant and more urgent uh, to what people need, or you're becoming next less relevant. And if you didn't do anything to figure out how to be more relevant that day, and you just relied on what you learned the previous days, then you're probably becoming less relevant as you go forward. Yeah, this point around adapting to the market is a theme that just keeps coming up as we as we talk about the, these different questions. And I think, Corey, you, you, you brought up a great example of kind of holding these smaller events. Uh, that has ended up being kind of the the way that we have dealt with this problem for this past year. Don't go to, you know, there's no, the, none of those big conferences are working that well with the virtual booths, but these smaller, more intimate events with a couple of customers are working and they're working quite well. Prashant, the, the next question is for you. Uh, and now we're getting a lot of questions on, on from the audience, which is fantastic. Uh, Alex asked this question about, you know, how do you think about uh, having a company and a product that is self-serve. And I'll, I'll try to broaden that a little bit. You know, there are two types of sales strategy. There's a tops down strategy, which obviously you uh, led in, in, in a pretty significant manner at Rackspace and, and Corey very much does manage as well. Uh, and then there's a bottoms up strategy, which is very much you know, using the community. And absolutely at Stack Overflow, you have one of the biggest developer communities out there. Any advice for CEOs as they're thinking about which strategy they should be implementing? Yeah, I think a great, great question. So I think in general, uh, my belief is that, especially in the era that we're moving towards, that product-led SaaS companies will probably outperform traditional SaaS companies with you know traditional kind of sales motions that are top-down, et cetera. Now, having said that, I think what is key is sort of the coming together of those two, those two things, tops down and bottoms up, right? And so even at Stack Overflow, as an example, as you mentioned, We've created, we first started out, and this is counterintuitive because most startups, people that are in the audience, likely founders, et cetera, start with a the product. They then go build a brand around that over a period of time. 
And then they think about building a community that's like truly kind of like what Corey is describing, but at a bigger scale, right? Where people are truly engaged and, and, and kind of talk to each other and solving problems. Stack Overflow, we did sort of the opposite, where we started with the community with no intention of perhaps thinking about a product. That was it. That was the product, it was creating the community in the public platform. And then that became sort of this brand over the course of a decade that, you know, everybody, you know, sort of ubiquitously like loved all developers and technologists, and they still love it. And that's why we have 100 million monthly users or uh, visitors. And then we have now embarked on a much more deliberate product led strategy to go build products uh, that will go to that. Now, answer that's sort of the evolution of the flipping of the kind of the order is kind of point number one. Point number two is the stops down versus bottoms up. And I think, you know, there's no, I am a big believer, especially if you have access to a large user base, like in our case, our public platform and community where you have literally every company, including Corey's company, Rapid7 probably has, you know, hundreds and th you know, thousands perhaps of employees. Uh, that are using Stack Overflow every day uh, or every month. The idea for us is to say, create a kind of an organic usage through freemium or free trial or whatnot, where people just like love the product. There's no different from what Slack did, right? And and on top of that, when you go into companies, it's actually very compelling if, you know, if, if we go into, let's say, Corey's company and say, hey, Corey, at Rapid7, you've got, you know, 1,000 of your technologists, developers, AWS, cloud professionals, et cetera, cybersecurity, IT people, all using Stack Overflow for Teams, which is our SaaS product. And then, by the way, here's the value as an organization, if you were to go from your freemium version, here's the value of using sort of a paid product. And that's a, that's a salesperson coming top down into, let's say, his CTO or CIO making the case. Uh, so, by the way, I will approach you, uh, Corey, at some point on this topic. But, <laughs> but in general, uh, but that, that's sort of the, that's, I think that is like the best of both worlds. You know, it's sort of this bottoms up where you've got adoption that's organic and it's basically for the love of the product and users, where the focus is on the user and the user generated value. And then it sort of becomes too sticky. And th there's so many examples like Slack or, uh, you know, Atlas, you know, you name it, right? A lot of bottoms up strategies, then augmented. I believe you still need tops down sales. I don't think uh, it's, you know, going to be gone. I think some companies like Atlassian do it, like where they don't have a large sales team. But I think uh, that's going to be more the exception than the norm. I think big enterprise deals, you still need the ability to have a top down sales team. And last one I mentioned here is the power and importance of customer success and almost thinking about how uh, you know sales becomes more about how do you enable the customer outcome and customer success becomes an even bigger, bigger portion of uh, you know the customer journey as part of this. So hopefully uh, that clarifies. What you're Lot, lots to unpack there. We'll talk a little bit more about Prash uh, Prashant about customer success in a, a subsequent question. Corey, I, I want to put pose the same question and, and Stuart asks a slightly different question uh, of exactly the same thing that Prashant just described, which is you know. We hear a lot about this product-led growth, and, and Prashant used that term. How is this impacting sales and marketing? You know, how does product-led growth work? Yeah, so uh, it, there's so much um, there. But what I would say is that the, the dream, I'll talk about the dream, because it's, it's, we don't all get to live the dream. But the dream of product-led growth is that you're engaging with your customers. One, customers come to you to solve a problem. Um, and you're engaging with them from a product perspective. You're marketing other capabilities from a product perspective. Um, and even on the, on the um, customer, both retention and expansion, all the things you think about sort of nurturing the customer, you're doing that from a product-centric experience. That's the Nirvana. There are some challenges there to, that, that we just talked about, at least in my experience. So if you think about the prior discussion, which I think was actually spot on, is when we think about product led, I think it's the right mentality to actually have, but you all have to think about how to make sure that the problems that you're trying to solve, how those problems are manifest in the organization and what the solution looks like as it rolls out is that you're actually thinking about the sales, the servicing and the customer success motion around all of that to actually uh, all of that together. One of the things that we've actually found is that if you think about what's easiest to do product led end to end, it's actually things that actually um, are encapsulatable within an individual scope. Um, and then the next easiest thing is that's encapsulatable on a group of people's scope that makes discrete decisions um, to actually sort of like participate. Things that are actually much more difficult to do in that model are things that actually have high degrees of complexity 
that span the scopes of individuals and small groups and really span organizations, infrastructures, have complex decision models, but also complex decisions in their actual implementations. And so what I would actually say is that we have to be very thoughtful about, um, I think you can do product led across everything, but it also shouldn't make you blind to actually what your actual customers need. There are some customers that actually need consultative sales because they're actually dealing with organizational complexity um, that they actually have to figure that out as part of it. Now, I would tell you from experience, one of the worst things you can actually do is to actually have to require consultative sales for a product that is actually too inexpensive. And so you have to actually match that all, uh, all up along the way. To get to the other aspect of, of your question about, you know, what do I think about sort of like, what does it mean? We're fairly disciplined, and I believe you have to be fairly disciplined about what's the realization within the customer. So when you talk about it, it's, you know, we tend to talk about too much, I personally think, about what we're promising. Our product delivers this. We're going to actually give you this. And I think that what successful companies do is they look at it from what does it take the customer to realize that problem? And so when you think about what does it take to actually realize the promise, then that actually gives you a lot of insight into basically how to engage initially, but also how to make sure that that engagement is going to be successful. And the ultimate goal of product-led, I think, um, engineering product-led businesses is to actually have a faster time to success with less friction for everyone. That way, the customer doesn't have to engage with salespeople they don't want to engage with, but the goal is success. And so this whole focus on am I realizing your promise, I think is a core thing to really focus on. Thanks, Corey. There's a lot of lot to unpack there. And you know, for the last few questions, we've spent a lot of time thinking about hiring needs. We've spent a little bit of time thinking about how you build out the sales and marketing team and how you connect it into product, how you ensure there's no cannibalization of product. Corey, for the next question, I want to stick with you and talk a little bit about geography. You, know, you are obviously now a very large company, and you have a couple of experiences of, of building out an international sales footprint. Uh, any any experiences? You know, you, you have lots to tell out, out here around things that have worked, things that haven't, as you've gone and taken Rapid7 outside of the United States? Well, I've taken Rapid7 uh, outside of the U.S. three times uh, in my tenure here. Uh, and it's because the first two and a half were complete disasters. Uh, <laughs> and it's not disasters. It's not even the it's just that we did lots of things that actually just didn't um, that didn't work. Um, and so, um, you know, the first time we actually did it, we just tried to do it on too skinny a, a, a investment and budget. You know, we said we're going to get a couple of smart people. We're going to go out and we did the things that you would expect to happen is we got some initial success in sort of like the low hanging fruit. And so it went there. And then it stalled because we didn't have a model about how we actually really sort of like built it out. And so that was sort of like, you know, version version one. Uh, the second time that we went out, I would say that we were too enamored on the pedigree front that I actually mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, and we got some sort of like people that were, um, you know, Prashanth actually talked about sort of like the different things. But what's tricky is that if you're in one phase, um, you know, in the US and you're in another phase there, um, you may need a different leader that's actually in a different phase of evolution. And we got the wrong person in the wrong phase. And we didn't really have a good sense to actually how to how to actually manage that. Ultimately, I think that, you know, you say, like, what's the pragmatic advice that, that we've gone through and from some of our failings about going out is one. You actually have to actually figure out when's the right time to actually go internationally. What I would suggest is that you actually go internationally when you actually have a functional sales motion in your core home market, whatever your core home market actually is. So if your core home markets happen to be in the US, you should have some repeatable process that you're able to scale, whether you're actually selling directly or if it's a marketing led funnel or if it's a sales team, whatever it is, you should have some level of stability and consistency um, there. Because what's really difficult is to have multiple things that are unstable and you're actually trying to figure it out across different models. So the question is, what's stable and what's core? What core assumptions can you then? And then you can actually take that and know that it's going to be different. No matter what no matter what anyone tells you, is you can't just assume it's going to cookie cutter. But you do have at least a stable set of assumptions to then sort of expand on. The, the, the last thing I would actually say there is that 
one of the things that you'll have to make an assessment on is what's the right magnitude of investment to actually um, make and what parts of the world do you want to actually target? And I would just say, uh, you know, right now, from where I stand, I would rather target a smaller part of the world with a more intentional investment that's more likely to actually get critical mass. To me, anytime you're expanding, you're actually trying to actually trend toward getting critical mass in an area. Thanks, Corey. And, and thank you for being candid about you know the failures you've had. I know we've We've talked about those privately, but it's it's great that you're you know describing some of the issues that that you faced, uh, even as a public company CEO. Uh, Prashant, we, you talked a little bit before this around customer success, right before this question. Uh, you obviously have a head of customer success at Stack Overflow uh, on your leadership team. Uh, when's the best time for a startup to go and have a customer success organization? And once they do, what are the metrics that they should be tracking? Yeah, I think great, uh, great question. So coming from Rackspace, that is so we're in the business of customer success, right? So we, would talk, we talked about fanatical support back in the day. It's more fanatical experience these days. Uh, but I've always been a believer uh, that customer success is uh, almost sort of an imperative uh, irrespective of stage. I mean, kind of many of the points Corey mentioned, especially as you think about starting out as a product, Hopefully your product does a lot of the value that, you know, kind of delivers a lot of the value that, uh, you know, you're, you're hoping to deliver. So it's really this, uh, you know, you know uh, Nick Mehta, who's the, the CEO of Gainsight recently, you know, he talks about this whole notion of, uh, you know, customer experience, customer outcomes, uh, right? And, and so the, the, that whole, that's really sort of what customer success is all about. So experience and outcomes. And so in that context, uh, you know, when do you, when do you not want that? You want customers to always deliver outcomes. You always want customers to have a tremendous customer experience. And irrespective of whether or not, um, you know, it's a complex product, whether it's a very, you know, where you're going to need, by definition, you're going to need people to kind of help them, you know, adopt the product. But even if it's a, even if it's a simpler product, I think the moment that you actually get product market fit and you actually have customers in your, uh, in, on your program or your platform, uh, early days, I'm sure it's like, you know, again, the ragtag group of, you know, 10 people that are doing everything, including customer success and doing, you know, building the product. And because you want the product and engineering team to be very close to the customer as they're constantly iterating on that product. But when you get to kind of this point where you believe you've got product market fit and you've got, you know, sort of fluttering, so to speak, I think that's when you really deliberately invest in customer success, in my opinion. And that's when I think you, you deliver on that promise of delivering repeatable value to Corey's point, getting to a certain outcome for the customer in a predictable way versus a reactive way. So the whole notion of customer success is like going from being completely reactive to being a lot more proactive and ultimately, hopefully very predictive, right? And so by using the product at the baseline of uh, saying, you know what, customers using the product X way, they've adopted this product, this feature maybe, and uh, and you know what that that gives us an indication of a leading indicator of like what they're trying to accomplish and then we, over time you have determined that if the customer does this on this feature this on this feature and this on this feature it's almost impossible for them not to love the product and for them not to kind of renew or not for, you know etc or grow so i think it gives you just a tremendous amount of insight and this kind of partnership between product and customer success post the stage of hitting product market fit i think is one of the most important combinations uh, and then to your question of the metrics, I would say that, you know, this is, you know, well, quite well documented, but at, at, at uh, Stack Overflow, you know, what we really look at, obviously, like traditional SaaS metrics around, you know, net retention rate, uh, which is a very common metric. Uh, coming from Rackspace, NPS, or so net promoter score is a very uh, critical customer satisfaction score that we've uh, historically tracked. And then adoption metrics, as it leads, think, think about the leading indicator point I just mentioned. So whether that's monthly active users or daily active users, depending on the level at which you can actually gain, get, gather this data uh, on a feature basis, uh, I think very important. Then ultimately, last one I would say is, none of this matters if you don't deliver the outcome. So in the context of ROI, in the context of what the customer is trying to solve, uh, and you can't have that kind of be a very squishy number or kind of a, a qualitative thing, it has to be somewhat measurable. I think measuring ROI for the customer, all those things then combine to create sort of a customer health score, which then gives you a sense of how healthy the customer is for retention and growth. Um, and, so that's and just, just a follow up, Prashant, to that, which just came in from Donald. Uh, he's asking, you know, kind of, when do you know that you should use some of these metrics? At what point can you actually trust NPS or NRR or any other metric in the customer success, you know, broader workflow? 
Yeah, I mean, you're going to need to obviously get to some level of critical mass for it to be sort of uh, valid, right? So I think the initial year of launching a product, I think that if you measure NRR, it's probably, you know, I think it's a very good like benchmark that you have to shoot for. Because if you think about, hey, how do I become, I want to be like Corey, I want to, you know, I want our company to be like a publicly traded SaaS company at some point. So what does a publicly traded SaaS company look like for NRR? It needs to be 120%. Okay, when you first launch a product, you know, it's probably going to be not that great right? because you're still like, you know, establishing the product market fit, et cetera. But the place where you, but it gives you something to shoot for, number one, whichever stage you're at, right, in your evolution. Um, but but I think that you want to kind of use some level of judgment to say if you're first launching the product, I mean, you want to give yourself a little bit of slack until you say you've figured out the kinks, you've put water through the pipes, it's actually working as intended, right, the kind of the experience. And then it's more of a, okay, are we, do we have the repeatability and, and discipline to be able to generate the outcomes in a very consistent way? So that's, I think it requires some judgment. It's not a perfect, can't give you like a perfect like time necessarily, but certainly it's this whole product market fit inflection. And then there's sort of this place where it gets to somewhat of an equi equilibrium state where it's not completely unstable as a product and what you're delivering for customers. Thanks Prashant. Corey, you, know, you talked a little bit about using the services organization to implement. Uh, you know, into your customer base. Uh, Rick asked a, asked a question around self-service and self-service products and security. And, and he asked, you know, does this work? Uh, you've obviously had some of this experience. I'd love for you to share, you know, does this work in, in, our, in the security industry? And, and if so, in which cases can a product be self-serve? Uh, so I think, so products can absolutely be self-service um, in almost any context. I, I think that in security, we have a history of engineering complexity in um, for the sake of solving a problem. And so like, you know, we solve problems, but this goes to the discussion that we had earlier about what's the cost of the customer to realize that solution. And so like, what's the cost and complexity? And so in, in, in Rapid7's done that, so sometimes you actually have to actually, you know, the way that I think about it and the way that we drive it is that if we create complexity for customers to realize a solution, then we have to actually think about um, services. And when I say services, you know, yes, some are paid, but many of them are unpaid to actually reduce that complexity. But that goes back to the point earlier is that we should engineer out that complexity because, you know, the only complexity I think you should actually have in the product is the customer's complexity that's reflective of their either their infrastructure challenges or their organizational design, but it should be customer centered complexity. What the security industry has done in general has actually created lots of what I would call unnecessary complexity along the way. And those are barriers to actually self-service. Now, what we've actually found is that when you actually reduce those barriers, uh, those artificial barriers, you can actually do great self-service um, for customers because it's not sort of, um, you're not trying to actually figure out the Rubik's Cube uh, with your eyes closed to actually figure out how to actually get the thing to work the way that you actually want it to work. And we actually have multiple products that are all different stages of their evolution and their ability to actually deliver unintended self-service value in the evolution there. So I would say it's 100% achievable in the security industry. It's just the industry is not good at overall. I think this goes back to the last question about when you start these things. I, I, I think you have to actually, while you don't worry about the results of the measurement till you actually got critical mass, as Prashant said, I think you're actually measuring these things early on and tracking and trending along the way. And so the things that I've, you know, I've evolved, the, the four things I used to look at, if you asked me this for like four years ago, I used to say, what is it actually, what's the cost and complexity for a, um, for any customer, uh, for any sales team to actually engage with any customer to actually prove out the value um, and when I say any sales team, it needs to be someone that's under 30 years old. I don't want an experienced sales rep because I want someone who I can actually train for three months and they should be able to engage with the customer, demonstrate, sorry, I have to get my son off the camera, <laughs> demonstrate the sales proposition um, and be able to get a sale at a price point where the customer feels that they're getting a good deal and it actually has sustained profitability and growth for us. Those were the four things that I was actually looking at. The things that I actually added on to that is you know, on the, what we consider product market fit has to get both the customer adoption, but then it says, what's the cost and the complexity for Rapid7 and the customer to actually have achieved that promise in a fast amount of time? So like what I wanna know is that basically, 
three months after the customer decided they were going to start um, receiving that promise, they should be able to get it. So how long does it actually take for them to actually do it once they decide they're going to start? start? And what's the cost associated, not just for us, but for the customer? How much time, how much resources, how many calls do they have to actually put in to us to actually solve that problem? And then once they actually do that, how fast do they actually want to expand? And so those six things we're actually tracking early on. And I would say, look, it takes us years to actually get that mix right. Um, but tracking it early allows us to actually constantly know what smells bad um, in the equation. No, that, that's a fantastic point. You know, there's so many more questions that I could ask, and there are more and more questions coming in from the audience, but we are out of time. So I do want to thank both you, you, Prashant, and Corey for joining us. There was some really great actionable you know, feedback that both of you provided for founders at all stages, uh, you know, topics around hiring, topics around how to build out teams, topics around how to go and sell product, and then all, ultimately listening to the customer. And if there's only one point that you as, as audience members, I would, I would listen to, it is this point around always be selling. And the fact that Prashant just asked Corey uh, during this panel, uh, to try to go and sell some more Stack Overflow into Rapid Seven, so that's a fantastic way. <laughs> it's a fantastic way to show that you know, at whatever spectrum you are, it's really, really important uh, to always be selling. Uh, so thank you so much, uh, Corey and Prashant, for joining us. For all of you on the line, uh, we have one last session for you. Uh, it's a very big event. We're going to have my partner Joanne having a candid conversation with Frank Slootman. CEO of Snowflake, and it's happening next on the next stage. You'll just need to click on stages on your left and click stage four. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining. And thank you so much, Corey and Prashant. Thank you, Sid. Thank you, Corey. Bye. Thank you, thank you both. Bye.